Welcome back amazing viewers to this channel and on this episode of this amazing debate with Sam Shimon, Sam debates an atheist who has question on Islam. Let's find out the truth from this amazing video. Hello? Yes. This is Oz. Yeah, we're just, I'm just waiting for you to insult and cuss so I can hang up on you. Are you going to be insulting? No, not at all. <laughs> oh, good, good. So Oz, uh, I know, nice name because Allah is the wizard of Oz. Are you a Muslim? Um, I'm not, but I, I, I called... Uh with a very uh, specific uh, intention. Is it um, referring to Islam? Yes, it is. Okay, yep. ask me, go ahead. If it's about Islam, go ahead. Yep, so so uh, personally, I, I'm an atheist, uh, but I have a- So uh, why do you care? Uh, what, well, hold on, hold no, on. No, 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 don't uh, put me all down. Why do you care? Because- Because of what? I, because I just had a buddy that he, he and I started our YouTube channels about the same time. He, he was an atheist and uh, about and uh, a month what? or two ago, he converted to Islam. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, buddy. Okay, go ahead. Um, and uh, his uh, his reasoning or, or, or what convinced him, you know, to uh, to convert or make that decision was based on uh, philosophy, but more specifically the Kalam uh, cosmological argument. How does that prove um, so Islam? I, I, How does the Kalam cosmological argument prove Islam? Great, great question. So, so I'll, I'll kind of walk you down. Um, the path and, and i was calling just to kind of get your bounce it off you guys because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I actually listen to you guys uh, when i'm up this late my time okay uh yeah. and, and appreciate the insight uh so what what they did is uh, it was about an eight or ninth eight or nine month process uh that they were uh talking to this gentleman and uh, they, they started with they? the they started with the kalam oh they did okay and, muslims okay good yeah uh, uh the yeah his uh muslim friends uh Started with the uh, the Kalam argument, mm -hmm. and you know he pushed back, pushed back, and, and they and, and I will say, in, in my opinion, they they created kind of a uh, echo chamber, you know, around him. But yeah. uh, they they got him to the point where he had to, uh, by gaslighting, if if, if you ask me, uh, admit that there had to be a uh, a necessary being, okay. you know, that there had to be a necessary uh, um, power. Uh, creator, and then once they got to that, which we would consider a gener uh, a spot of uh, being general theism, mm -hmm. uh, then they started to attack the different religions. So they went after Christianity, uh, and and um, and I'm talking about you know their their discussions right now. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, fine. They they What's their they, uh, they eliminated um, you know between uh, they and him uh, eliminated the Trinity. Yeah, which uh, is so impossible. That, so that they took can't out do Christianity. That. Um, then they took out, you know, the uh, um, uh, the Hindu gods and um, you know yeah. the, the the more Eastern uh, Orthodox gods. Uh, then it really came down to then either Islam uh, or Judaism. And once they got the Judaism, uh, they dispelled Jesus ever being a you know part of the the God plan or the God God head. Yeah, you know, impossible um, for them to do. That. They yeah. then went to Islam. So with, with your guys' background, you know, with yeah. Christianity and Islam, I just, I wanted to, to bounce that off you guys and get your opinion. Yeah, well, you got to give me their specific objections because everything they told them was based on lies. So what objection did they give that uh, ended up nullifying the Trinity or the deity of Christ? So so the Trinity, uh, they said that, it, um, that the Trinity defies the laws of logic, the three laws oh. of logic. How does it defy the laws of logic? Uh, well, so uh, ex uh, to, to just be beginners, the the law of the excluded middle that you, you, there has to be either it is or it isn't. There's a middle, so it's it's either you are there is a god or there's no god. There can't be three. No, well, yeah, that's we're not gods. talking yet. Well, there the Trinity is not three gods. So I don't get what they're saying. Okay, well, and I'm just giving you their arguments. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm trying really... to respond to them, but I'm trying to figure out what their argument is. So far, all it is is that they convinced them the Trinity is not true. Therefore, the only conception of God is true is the Islamic one. But that actually fails to take into consideration Islamic teaching about the nature of God. It is a lie from the pit of hell when they say that Allah or their concept of God is that God is unipersonal. Because if he became a Sunni Muslim, which as I'm assuming he became a Sunni Muslim, right? Yes, sir. Okay, well in Sunni Islam, the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah, Kalam Allah. So then you ask your friend, and I hope he calls him, tell him to call us. Uh, so if the Quran is the speech of Allah, it's uncreated. Is it Allah or is it different from Allah? 
Now, he's going to have to say it's different from Allah. But it's uncreated, right? Yes. So if Allah is uncreated and the Quran is uncreated and the Quran is not Allah, how many uncreated entities do you have? Oh, well, uh, if if I understand what you just uh, what you just said, uh, I, I would say we, we don't know. There, there could be a lot, right? No, what I just said in my example, if you're listening, I gave you only two examples of uncreated entities that Sunni Islam posits. Oh, for Sunni. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so there, there's two. There, there would be two. Okay, but so how then can Allah be absolutely one and the only uncreated beginningless entity when the Quran is also uncreated and beginningless and it's not Allah? How do you have two uncreated beginningless entities according to Sunni Islam? Yeah, in that argument, I actually... Like I would, I would agree with you uh, on that. That that was my argument with him because even on the Kalam, you know, the the uh, the first premise, you know, everything, <laughs> everything that ha uh, that is ha had to have a a cause. No, that's well, not the argument. Anything that began to exist must have a cause, but not everything began to exist. Right, and that's what I'm saying. That if and again, maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but based on what I heard from you, I was basing the Kalam on what he has said to yeah, me well, so Yeah, well, if far. he said it, he misrepresented it. The Kalam argument is not that everything has a cause. That's not the Kalam argument. The Kalam argument is everything that has a beginning must have a cause that brought it into being. Not everything has a cause. Everything that began to exist or has a beginning has a cause. That's the argument. Right. Yeah, and, and I, I, I did um, I did state it incorrectly. Um, but yeah, that, that that's uh, that's that was their premise. But but even even on that, ba based on uh, the the studying that that I've and, and mine's been uh, little at this point. I, I've yes. been digging into uh, Islam more now because of his conversion. Uh, but st still, w within everything that I've heard so far with Islam uh, and what he stated, I still don't know how that first premise doesn't shatter. Yeah. under the is islam world yeah well that's why you have him call me so i can engage him but my question for you would be ask him is the quran uncreated he's gonna have to say yes is the quran allah no so the quran is uncreated but it's not allah and yet allah is uncreated that's two uncreated entities that are not the same so where do you get that you believe in only one god because if the quran is uncreated and only god is uncreated then the quran must be god as well but the quran is not god allah that means you have two uncreated gods so bring that up to him and then have him call me. We can take it from there because I don't want to be refuting him by proxy. Let him call and I'll address him. Right. If I could ask uh, one, maybe two more things that yeah, I do know for a fact. Islam, I, 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 can, I can talk more intelligibly on this because I come from a Christian background. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, since you're uh, into the Kalam cosmological argument, are you trying to refute it? The best defender of it is not Muslims. It's William Lane Craig. So when you get a chance, go to Reasonable Faith, the website and the YouTube channel. William Lane Craig is a renowned Christian philosopher that's even respected by atheist philosophers. He is the leading champion of the Kalam cosmological argument. Listen to his debates and his lectures on Kalam because the Kalam cosmological argument wasn't created by Muslims. It was developed by Muslims, but it came from a Christian and a Christian that was influenced by the Greeks. So in reality, it's from the Greeks through the Christians to the Muslims. The Muslims developed it, and William Lane Craig is now their leading champion in the Kalam cosmological argument. So if you want to hear a very sophisticated, a very high-level, sophisticated, intellectual defense and articulation of Kalam, you don't get it from the Muslims. You're going to get it from William Lane Craig. So yeah, look him up. And yeah, and I love that you said that because uh, just the the last week, week and a half, um, I've become a, a, a big um, William Craig Lang, uh, William Lane Craig fan be man. because I, I I love how he he simpl simplistically tries to walk people through exactly through the Kalam. Yeah, um, and the so, Muslims so, that he heard from, uh, they're terrible uh, defenders of the Kalam. And I'm not saying you know the Kalam is true or false. That's something you're going to have to decide. What I'm saying is, if you want to hear a very high level highly polished intellectual sophisticated articulation of the kalam you go to william lane craig yeah and so far i would agree he, he he's the one that that uh 
uh, simplifies it the best where, where in, anybody listening to it, whether you're a beginner or you've been doing it a long time, can, can digest it and, and, and understand it. I, w- I would definitely yes. agree with that. So what was your other, um, yeah, what's your questions about Islam? Go ahead. So, the, so the other one would be, uh, you know, for myself, uh, I do, like I said, I, I, I do have a Christian background, mm-hmm. um, and their, their process in eliminating, uh, Jesus as, uh, you know, as, as, as part of, uh, as part of the deity, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, 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 uh, just, just, uh, simplifying that character down to mm-hmm. just being a, a prophet that did, did good things, uh, what what is, what is your guys's? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I know see, this is what I'm what's saying. Your, you, gotta, you have to give me a more a more clear cut objection because they're telling me Jesus isn't God. Why? Why isn't he God? We'll say, well, he didn't claim it. Well, how do you know he didn't claim it? Uh, because the Quran. I see. This is why I got to know what the argument is. Why are you denying the deity of Christ? Well, they're either going to deny it because the historical Jesus didn't claim to be God. Or even if he claimed to be God, it's a false claim. Well, they can't say it's a false claim because they believe Jesus is a true prophet. So they're going to have to argue that Jesus never claimed to be God. That's why I'm saying I have to know what the specific objection they raise so I can shut it down for you. A Muslim can either tell me that Jesus is not God because he never claimed to be because he's just a man. Or even though he claimed to be God, that's a false claim. Well, they can't opt for that because Jesus is not a false prophet, according to them, right? Right. Yep. So they can't say that Jesus claimed to be God, but he lied. He was either a liar or a madman. So they have to argue that Jesus never claimed to be God. But then when I ask them, well, how do you know? They'll say, well, the Quran says that Jesus is just a messenger. But here's the problem. The Quran, at best, if we go with the traditional narrative, if we go with the traditional narrative, is a 7th century document. As you are perhaps already aware you have on this channel my brother Al Fadi and Jay Smith, who are breaking down the research of Dan Gibson, where now the evidence overwhelmingly points to the Quran originating not in Mecca in the seventh century, but further north in Petra. So the archaeological evidence destroys the traditional narrative. But let's put that aside. Let's go with the traditional narrative. Here is a document composed in the seventh century by a man in arabic <clears throat> over 600 years before the, the birth of jesus and this document is written in a language that wasn't spoken by either jesus and the apostles and it's telling me what jesus and the apostles believed and taught in the first century which serious historian of the historical jesus would even venture into looking into the quran as a serious historical source on the historical jesus Anybody? Uh, given. Uh, All right, guys. This is the part where this video gets more interesting. If you are yet to subscribe to this channel, please do so and hit the notification button to be notified each time we post a new video. Let's get back to this video to get more details. Given that layout, no. If you're a historian, you're not a theist. You're just a historian. And you want to reconstruct the history of Jesus? Are you going to go to the seventh century document, the Quran? No, that, that's what I'm saying. G- given yeah. that, given that layout, no. So when historians want to reconstruct the life of the historical Jesus, what documents do they turn to? Uh, they'll go to well, ob- obviously the, uh, the the Gospels, the New Testament, uh, Josephus. Um, yes, Josephus. So even a Bart yeah, Ehrman, yeah. Bart Ehrman, who's an agnostic slash atheist. When he writes a book defending the historicity of Jesus, and he debated Robert Price. Robert Price is the Jesus mythicist. Bart Ehrman, of all people, debated him. It's on YouTube. And in my estimation, and I'm biased, obviously, he schooled him, showing that Jesus existed historically. But how did he do that? Because he applies the criteria that historians have come up with to determine whether something happened or most likely happened or didn't happen. On the basis of that criteria, he will tell you that the historical Jesus existed. Now, in the case of Bart Ehrman, he believes that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they have Jesus claiming divinity, that's not the historical Jesus. That's those writers putting in the mouth of Jesus claims of divinity. How does he arrive at that? Well, he does so inconsistently. But what's my point? If I go with the first century documents, and if I go with the letters of Paul, which even Ehrman says are the earliest documents, written by the Christian community. For example, Ehrman believes 
that first Thessalonians is the first book of the New Testament, what eventually became the New Testament canon, canon and he dates it around 49, 50 AD. Well, if we go with that dating, then we find that the first generation, the first generation of eyewitnesses to the historical Jesus, because Paul is writing when there are hundreds, if not thousands of eyewitnesses, both friendly and hostile, those who knew Jesus and those who opposed Jesus, they're still alive in 49 AD. And this is Ehrman, get his writing. Uh, don't take my word for it. I, I love, I'm, I'm a Herman fan. So okay, so you know what I'm telling you. I'm not making up. This is what he says. Yep. Okay, now, you have Jews like Paul and Gentiles who have given up the worship of the gods and goddesses, and they're already worshiping Jesus as the divine Son of God who died and rose again and ascended into heaven and sits enthroned with God as Lord over creation. So here's my question to the Muslim and to you. What would have led a group of monotheistic Jews? This is now 49 AD. That means the things he's mentioning in his letter are things already believed on and assumed by his audience before he writes it. Because if he's coming up with something new, if he's writing something new, then he has to defend it. The fact that he mentions things in passing in his letter without defending why he says this or believes this means that he believes that the audience he's writing to shares those beliefs with him so in that letter he mentions jesus is the son of god whom god raised to life who will come on the day of the lord to judge the living and the dead because he is the lord of the day of judgment okay what would have led a group of monotheistic jews and greeks who used to worship zeus and artemis and diana you name it hermes to now stop worshiping the gods and goddesses and now start worshiping a Jew who within less than 20 years was killed by the Romans. What would lead these two groups to worship him as the divine son of God, as their Lord reigning in heaven, who would return to judge the living and the dead? Who, for me, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't know a good answer to that. Okay, that's fine. Um, but now as a Muslim who's confronted with historical documentation a muslim has to contend with this because according to the quran the followers of jesus were muslims but here we have data showing that the followers of jesus were the first ones to worship jesus as the divine son of god risen to life sent it to heaven reigning from heaven on the father's throne as lord of creation and would come to judge the living and the dead so historically that destroys Islam. But then a better question. If Jesus never claimed to be the divine son of God, why would his Jewish followers start worshiping him as such? Where did they come up with that belief? Uh... If I don't claim to be the son of God, why then would you go around worshiping me as the son of God? And then why would you go around worshiping me as the son of God if I'm dead and buried and I've become dog food? And what Boy, would lead you to claim that God raised me physically alive into heaven? But in in and uh, uh, this, way, I'll tell my buddy to call it because for me, when you when you ask me that question and not having converted to uh, Islam, you know, my my question would be: Does the uh, Quran or the Bible have? Um, do, do they have? Like when we say, um, were, were there any co contemporary um, authors, you know, or yeah, well, um, authorship? Let's you know, go with Ehrman. In, in that time. And, and that, that would be mine. And I know that's I know that's. Well, let's go with you. Tonight, so we, don't have, we don't have to go there. No, no, but hold on. I want to ask you because you say you follow Ehrman. Let's go with Ehrman. Doesn't Ehrman believe these are first century documents, even though they're anonymous? At the case with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Uh, he does, yes. Yes. And doesn't he still look to these documents? And applies the historical method to determine which statements in these documents go back to the historical Jesus, and he reconstructs the life of the historical Jesus. Uh, Ur Ur Urban does. Yes. yes. Okay. So and, what and I'm there, saying there's... is, even by skeptical critics who are hostile to Christianity, you cannot escape the fact these are contemporary accounts, even by Urban's standards, not mine. 
And I'm not even, I'm not even telling you John wrote John. I'm saying we go with what he says. Matthew wrote Matthew, but okay, he doesn't believe that. But he still will tell you this gospel that's attributed to Matthew is first century. It's written within the first two generations of the eyewitnesses and Mark. But I didn't even go there. I went with Paul that Ehrman clearly believes Paul wrote First Thessalonians. He clearly believes Paul wrote First Corinthians. That's Ehrman because you studied him. So you know I'm not making this up. Okay, now my question to you, let's take that. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians in 55 AD by Ehrman's dating. This is in his writings and his sessions, which you know because you said you're a fan of this. So you know I'm not making it up. Right. Paul writes to a group of people within 20 years of Jesus's death and alleged resurrection. Let's say alleged. Okay, so let's just speak neutrally. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 15, which even Ehrman would say is a tradition inherited by Paul, not created by Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15, he mentions in verse 6 that there are more than 500 people still most of whom are still alive. He says 500, more than 500 people who saw Jesus alive after he was dead and buried, most of whom are still alive at the time of his writing. So let me ask you a question. How did Paul get away with appealing to nearly 500 living witnesses within 20 years of Jesus' resurrection as having seen the risen Jesus alive, convincing them that he's no longer dead but alive and went to heaven if Paul was lying and making it up. Because um, he's not writing to you and me. He's writing to contemporaries who can easily falsify his claim. And he's writing to Greeks who used to worship gods and goddesses who then gave up the worship of gods and goddesses to worship this Jew. Well, and, and that's where that's where my skepticism uh, kicks in because we when we refer to the 500, um, we can we can easily make that statement. Or the, yeah, but how does he easily make it and get away no, with it? There's no way. There's no way to verify. Like you we can't don't, verify. We, we account of Paul, but we can't verify any any accounts of those 500. Yeah, but like there's no, no accounts. Well, you're not listening. I'm, you can't because you're living now. But he's not writing to you. He's writing to people 20 years from the time of Jesus's death. How did he get away with it? Because those Greeks then worship Jesus. Why did they give up their worship of Zeus to worship this Jew, whom they knew was killed as a criminal and buried? Well, if, if okay, so if we're going to go back to those times, because the the, the, the I'm going those, by Ehrman's dating, right? The, like the like, well, yeah, but but I, I'm not, whether it's Ehrman or whomever, uh, the the mythological gods like uh, Zeus and the the others, uh, those came along and, and pe people moved on to the uh, you know the, the newest idea of a uh, a god or a, or a deity as they rolled out and they became yeah, but more popular. You're, that's not my argument. If you're my argument, I'm saying, why would Greeks worship a Jew who's not a Greek, who had just recently been killed and buried and be convinced this Jew reigns as God in heaven with the Father and abandon the pantheon of the Greek gods and goddesses for the Jewish God? Because this is happening in 20 years. This is not... Hundreds of years later, this is 55 AD, which means the death of Jesus had just recently taken place. So why would Greeks start worshiping the Jewish God and believe this Jewish criminal who had been killed by the Roman authorities is now reigning as God and worthy of their worship, so they abandoned the worship of Zeus? Right, well, well, well Paul, Paul was the great influencer there. So you're right? saying Paul was able to influence people who are still around within the very time when Jesus was killed, who could have traveled to Jerusalem and claimed 500 people are still alive that seen Jesus alive and yet convinced them somehow to worship this Jew instead of worshiping the gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon. Man, Paul is very uh, powerful, dude. Maybe yeah, he had some no, I, I, mushrooms. I, I, absolutely, I absolutely believe in the New Testament, Paul, Paul is is the most powerful figure uh, other than the god figure yeah but according uh, to ehrman paul, according he, to ehrman well front let's go with it even ehrman paul did not invent the resurrection he inherited it he was taught it so what convinced the people before him to believe in the resurrection according to ehrman the guy that you read he didn't yeah. invent the resurrection he inherited it so yeah that's what he says i deliver to you he says as a first importance 
which which mean I er inherited the knowledge about it and I'm delivering it to you right now. Even Ehrman that you've read says that. In fact, according to Ehrman and how Jesus became God, you go read it. He says that Peter and Mary Magdalene, just to name two, just to name two of Jesus' disciples, had what he called bereavement visions that convinced them that God had raised Jesus physically, bodily to life and now was reigning physically, bodily in heaven as God. So Paul, whatever influence he had, he didn't come up with it. He was simply passing on what was already believed before him. But that's not even my question. The fact that Jews started worshiping a Jew. What would lead Jews to worship a Jew when they know that's anathema? What led Greeks less than 20 years of Jesus' death to worship a Jew? It's not even one of their ethnic kinsmen and abandon the worship of their gods and goddesses. I'm still waiting for an answer for that. Right. Well, that's what I was explaining is uh, Paul, Paul's message of saved by grace through faith uh, and how he addressed the Greeks, I, I believe 100 percent is what is what convinced the Greeks that it, it was um, it was good and acceptable to believe in. But that's not what First Corinthians it, 15 it, says, right? He says that your salvation is based on that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures and was raised on the third day according to our scriptures. And he goes, then this is what saves you, provided you do not believe in vain. So so, so then in Romans where it says uh, that Christians are saved by grace through faith, is that irrelevant then? What's the grace that saves you? That Christ died and was raised and you must confess him as Lord. That's the same book of right. Romans, right? Romans 10? Yeah. And, and that's what so I'm saying. what that, would lead Jews, it, again, you didn't answer the question, what would lead Greeks to believe that this Jesus, this Jew, died and was raised, and he is the Lord that we must confess to be saved freely out of his favor. The, no, and that, that's what, and I'm sorry if it wasn't clear. My, my, my belief, my outlook on that is when, when Paul said to uh, Greek, Jewish, uh, the Jews, anybody, that you, you are saved by grace through faith and, and not works, uh, and, and not by your lineage or, you know, not by uh, the, the color of your skin. The, the, this yeah, but is, you're not completing the, the, it. It's not you're saved by grace alone. You're saved by the grace of the one that was killed for your sins and was raised and he reigns in heaven and you must confess him as Lord. Finish it. That's not just saved by grace. It's not saved by grace. What is the grace that saves you? The grace of the Jew that was killed buried and raised to life and now reigns as Lord, turn to him and give up Zeus if you want to be saved by his favor. Why do you keep ignoring that part? No, 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 I'm not. I'm just telling you what I, what I know in Romans. Okay, but that's in Romans 10, 9, the same Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Why are you excluding that from Romans? No, no, I'm not, I, I was just given the, the, the simplistic measure. You, you asked me, what would convince yeah Greeks what okay to, so to what buy, would convince to, okay you're a greek living at that time what would convince you hey you don't need to earn your right to immortality and especially when greeks laughed and scoffed at the day at the idea of a physical bodily resurrection to immortality the greeks thought that the flesh the material realm was evil and that salvation was liberation from the body so you live immortally as souls so what convinced the Greeks not only to accept this Jew as their Lord who would save them freely out of his favor, but then they would be saved in bodies that would be made immortal when their worldview taught that the flesh is what you want to discard and continue to live as disembodied souls. Right, and, and, that, and that's where, so, so if I am back, way back then where very few people could read for themselves and, and comprehend for themselves. All right. If I were if I were a Greek person, they said that you can be saved by grace through faith. And, and yes, you, you can. We, we can add on that you're mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not add on. We yeah, can finish okay, the, brother, yeah, the rest I, of the To be honest with you, I, I, I would I would agree. Yeah. No, I'll be yes, honest. Greek, then I would agree to that. Okay. Anyway, tell your friend to call because uh, we're just ta talking past each other. Have him call me, and we'll talk more about it. So. So have him call me, we'll talk. But we're talking past each other right now. But anyway, let him call me and I'll answer his question. So may God guide you on your journey. All right, thanks. Anytime, buddy. Take care. All right.
Okay, man, we got a good crowd. We have over 350. What's going on, man? We do, we do, and uh, that was a good com conversation. I think it was. No, it was. That's why I engaged them. I engaged them for the benefit of the Christians to learn how to argue their faith historically. Yeah, and of because course, I mean, uh, I, I didn't want to step in and uh, uh, you know add more, but uh, you know his his uh, argument, uh, and I, I, I see his point, of course, where he's coming from based on his own knowledge. He thinks somehow Paul was able to sway. Uh, or persuade the uh, the yeah. Greek, but, but if that's the case, then uh, why were the Jews also able to persuade them to think about works at the same that's time? That's what I kept saying. Yeah. No, and I, I, what I was saying is, forget the salvation by grace part. It's the salvation by grace is anchored in believing a Jew was killed, and that Jew was raised to life, and that Jew reigns as God in heaven. And if you believe in that Jew, out of his favor will be saved. But he kept focusing that you're saved by grace, not works. But no, 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 no. The grace that saves you is believing in a Jew as your God who's now alive after being killed. What convinced them to exactly. believe in that Jew? And in their worldview, the Greeks discarded and scoffed at the flesh. Why do you think in Acts 17, 30 to 32, when Paul spoke of God raising Jesus from the dead, it says that they scoffed at him because for the Greek, it was repulsive. To, be, to believe that you would continue to live in physical bodies forever. That's what they wanted to get rid of. They believed in continuing to live immortally as disembodied souls without a physical body. Here the Jews taught something contrary. No, you'll be raised in your bodies and in your bodies you'll be judged or live forever. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, as a former Muslim. It would have been easier for the Greek to follow the logic of the Judaizers, that there is work that is needed because we they would have witnessed a lot of Jews doing that versus just a minority who are new now following something that is different and they're being persecuted for it also. 100%. This is why I tell brethren, you know what the greatest nightmare for the atheist is? Do you know what the greatest nightmare for the Anytime, us, us. I, my policy, Oz, is this. He's, he's telling me, thank you for the respectful conversation. I've said it and you're proof of it. When someone asks me sincere questions or raises sincere objections, and he's not mocking or blaspheming the Lord, I will do all I can to answer those objections to the best of my ability out of love and respect. It's only when you have someone who mocks or blasphemes, insults my Lord, or insults the Bible or bullies Christians that I give them a taste of their medicine. And Oz, you don't need to thank me. If you're going to be respectful and bring up objections, I will spend all the time necessary to answer those objections to the best of my ability. But if someone mocks and blasphemes, that's when the gloves are off and I'm going to go for the juggler, spiritually speaking. But coming to the issue, I wanted to make one more comment. For the Christians, this is how you need to argue your faith because Christianity, according to Jesus and the apostles, is based on predictive prophecies prophecies uttered centuries before the coming of Jesus that said when Messiah comes, he'll be killed and be raised. And Jesus coming, being killed, and then being raised, and the eyewitnesses to his resurrection proclaiming that and willing to die for it. So one of the greatest nightmares for atheism is the birth of the church. It's one of the, I'm not exaggerating. When you are able to articulate the birth of the church to an atheist, the church came into being because the followers of Jesus claimed to have seen him alive after being killed. What led them to that belief? And what caused monotheistic Jews to worship their countrymen, a Jew, as their God, and then Greeks to abandon their gods to worship a Jew as their God? This is a nightmare for atheism. I'm not exaggerating. It's a nightmare. It really is, if you understand the evidence for the resurrection and its implication. Anyway, brother, I, I've said a mouthful. What do you want to do now? No problem. I think uh, we'll call it a night and uh, hopefully... Great night. We're at about 350, brother. Great. Praise God. Yeah, amen. Uh, hopefully in a couple of days, uh, you'll be able to join me back again, brother. Yes, I'm free. Lord willing, let me know. Guys, you have my permission. Take my articles. Take my sessions. Upload them. Uh, disseminate them. Make clips out of them. Translate them because this is for you. We want you to learn your faith. Know your faith and live it, not just know it. Pray for Al, pray for me, pray for one another that we live our faith. Live the Bible, love the Bible, obey the Bible, and love the God of the Bible by our actions. And the Lord keep us from sinning 
and give us perfect self-control. And do pray for Al, his family. Pray for his support. Pray for more Patreon supporters. Pray for my support. Pray for my daughters. The Lord Jesus will bring them to me. And we'll always serve you as long as Jesus wants us to serve you. Until he returns or calls us home, we are your servants for the sake of Jesus. And remember this, Jesus is alive and he's in love with you. May we be in love with him. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. Amen. Maybe next time, brother, we'll start with this uh, excellent question by Michael Stein about why do Muslims think that Mary is part of the Trinity? So we'll start with this next time. <laughs> okay, yeah. keep that in mind. All right, Lord. Willing. All right. God bless you. Christ is you, brother. You know, love you, brother. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, moderators, thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Prophet Google, get in touch with me for sure. I Please, need it. Prophet Google. Contact him on Facebook or wherever because this guy will be a blessing. He knows how to do cartoon sessions and cartoon drawings. He's an amazing blessing to the ministry. He's amazing. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much uh, for making time for us. And a uh, couple of days we'll be in touch and hopefully you can join us again. Amen. Christ is risen. Right. risen the modern author. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. Take care. Welcome back, guys. I believe you're able to learn something new from these amazing videos. Let us know what you've learned in the comment section. He said that he is an atheist. That is, he doesn't believe in the existence of God, but his argument is on the defense of Islam. That the cosmological test carried out eliminated Christianity from logic. That the idea of Trinity defies every logic. My question is, if you are the devil, who will you support, the truth or against the truth? What Muslims don't know is that they are not monotheists, that is, they don't believe in one God. If you study Islam carefully, you will realize that they have more than one God. Take for example, they believe that the Quran is not created and Allah is uncreated, that is, nobody created the Quran and nobody created Allah. At this point, they have to uncreate it. Some will come to, to argue with you that the Quran is the essence of Allah. The truth is, if something is an essence of a being, it means the essence came out of that being. Therefore, it is manufactured out of that being. It means that it was created out of that being. And if you continue with that ideology that the Quran is uncreated, it means you have to uncreate it. Allah and the Quran, making the Quran same as Allah and I believe that is an abomination in your religion. I believe that the Bible is the most historically correct, the most historically accurate and genuine book or manual ever, predicting time and season with correct evidence of the past, upholding the current event and predicting the future accurately. The so-called Quran that says it explains everything in details can't even keep the record of its own prophet accurately. Guys, let us know what you think about this video in the comment section and also don't forget to share this video with your friends and your family and do well to subscribe to our channel for more amazing videos like this. Thank you for watching and see you in our next video.